Greetings. One of the most successful videos on this channel in terms of traffic has been this video over here, which is a remake of a video where I speak about how China has outperformed any other comparison in terms of its economic progress, leaving behind the country that is often compared to it, India, in the dust to the extent that there is really no comparison between the two. And we all hear about how much China has grown in the last 30 years or 40 years. But the question becomes, is that really the correct starting point? And how do we assess periods immediately before that within the context of what China's potential was? Is it reverting back to where it should have been a long time ago despite the fast growth? And things like that. So I go to this chart here from Google, and this is the per capita GDP in US dollars of China in relation to Sub-Saharan Africa. And we know that when China undertook substantial modernization and new reforms in the 1978-79 period, because Chairman Mao had passed on and now you had Deng Xiaoping, then it started to grow more quickly. But before that time, for 30 years before that period, China was in fact doing extremely poorly. It was consistently one of the poorest countries in the world. It had a number of disasters enacted by Mao, such as the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward, which caused the death of many tens of millions of people, depending on what death you attribute to those direct actions versus not. They really tried to micromanage many aspects of the economy. They even tried to make some undesirable creatures extinct, and the poor sparrow was caught in that because the sparrow was very unfairly lumped along with the rat, the mosquito, and the cockroach. But of those four, only the sparrow was the one that they managed to get close to near extinction. And this led to a crop failure because the sparrows were no longer there to eat the insects that were destroying crops and millions of humans died of starvation as a result. So this chart only goes back to 1960, but the period in question we want to take is 1950. And as you can see here, China was much poorer than Sub-Saharan Africa in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And it only shot ahead in the early 1990s. And now it's so far ahead that the two should not even be compared. In fact, China is turning all of Africa into its own vassal state and natural resource extraction center. China's per capita GDP of 9,770 even in 2018 versus sub-Saharan Africa of just 1585 is a huge gap. One would scarcely believe that there was a time when their fortunes were almost reversed. In 1981, sub-Saharan Africa was more than four and a half times more prosperous than China. So was the turnaround really dependent on just Chairman Mao passing on and Deng Xiaoping saying that we now have different priorities in China and we're gonna focus on economic growth to the exclusion of other militarism and micromanagement of the economy that China experienced under Mao? Well, for the most part, at least as per the data, the answer is yes. So I'm gonna show you a PowerPoint presentation about how to look at this. From 1950 to 1979, there was virtually no growth in China's economy and it was consistently one of the poorest countries in the world. And I mean absolute poorest, often in the bottom 10 or 15, with most of Sub-Saharan Africa doing better than China. So while the growth rate from 1979 to present has been a very impressive 8% a year, higher than any other country of any significant size over the same period, this should be viewed in the context of it just reverting to the trend line relative to the suppression against the trend line from the 1950 to 1979 period. Here you had a relatively well-educated, industrious people, and they were turned into one of the poorest countries in the world because they had a system similar to what North Korea still has, and they were very poor. And therefore, if you take a starting point from 1950 to present, the growth rate is only 5% a year. Still better than most countries, but not as super fast as one may think. This springback effect has to be viewed in the context of the suppression for 29 years up to this point. And if you still doubt that China was one of the 10 poorest countries in the world for most of the 1950 to 1979 period, in fact, well into the 1980s because this recovery only began in earnest in the 90s, well, let me show you a YouTube video about that. So this is the poorest country in the world listed from the absolute poorest on down. Starting in 1960, remember China's worst period was in fact the 1950s, but even in the 1960s, you can see here where my cursor is, China is one of the bottom 10. This continues onwards, so we'll skip ahead a fair bit into the 70s. So again, you see China in the bottom 10 here in the 70s. And in 1978, this is when China hit its lowest point. It was the third poorest country in the world. Only two countries, Nepal and Guinea-Bissau, were poorer than China in 1978. 
and only one sub-Saharan African country, Guinea-Bissau. Every other country you could possibly think of was more prosperous than China. China was the third poorest country in the world within the lifetimes of many people still alive today, 1978. So we continue. Now even here in the 80s, China is still in the bottom 10. Now it's finally starting to improve somewhat, some economic growth. But here, even in 1986, China is still in the bottom 15 or so. 1987. Still in the bottom 20 of the world in 1987-88. Now, finally in 1989, China has left the bottom 20 forever. But as we could see, all the way from 1950 through 1989, China has been among the poorest countries in the world and got as low as third poorest and did not get out of the bottom 20 all the way until 1989. And the chart that we saw earlier corroborates that. It only started to shoot up from this point over here. It got out of the bottom 20 and then really took off from 1993 onwards and never looked back, just like what we saw in even that PowerPoint slide that I made. It was a spring back effect from having been frozen in a 1950s era of prosperity, technology, education, enlightenment, everything. And then finally, when reforms occurred, a lot of that pent up energy was allowed to release itself and China's economy has done extremely well since then. And now it's a fully middle income country from being one of the poorest countries in the world not too long ago, barely 30 years ago. And so it's analogous to two other examples that we've seen in smaller countries. We had West Germany versus East Germany. East Germany was only one fifth of the prosperity of West Germany when the Berlin Wall fell. And then when unification occurred, the integration and parity took some time to manifest, but has largely been successful. But that communist system made East Germany only one fifth as prosperous as West Germany was. And so we saw that as one example. And then an example closer to China and very similar to China is North Korea. After the Korean War, the two halves of Korea proceeded along their respective models. And until the mid 1980s, North Korea was not behind. You could not have predicted necessarily that South Korea would do this much better than North Korea relative to where they were in the mid 80s because communism in the beginning does not hamper a country from its trend line. Only over time does the negative baggage tend to accumulate and the disincentives and people forgetting how to work. And so now South Korea is of course 20 times more prosperous than North Korea. So China can be considered a combination of North Korea and South Korea in that it was like North Korea in the early part of this period, 1950 to 1979. It started some market reforms. It's still not a democracy even now in 2000. 2022, but in an economic sense, it is adopting a lot of the practices that it saw working in South Korea and Taiwan, as well as some innovation of its own. And therefore the North Korea-like period of China that existed under Mao was something that is in the past. And a lot of people in China don't know about that. That history is being erased because it's embarrassing in a way. But the springback effect is certainly salient and something to look at because the rapid growth is a reversion to the trend line. And has the reversion completed or not, it's hard to say. China is still growing at a rate much faster than the West, but because of its great size, eventually it has to converge to the rest of the world's average. I don't think it's at that point yet. It can keep going perhaps until it's almost at the prosperity level of South Korea and Taiwan. Now, those are not perfect comparisons either because a small country like South Korea or Taiwan can survive on an export based model much longer than a huge country like China can. However, China has benefits in terms of economies of scale by being a large country. So this large country, small country comparison may not be disadvantageous to a large country like China at all. It depends on how much each factor ends up weighing. But always remember the pre-1979 period in any discussion about China's rapid growth because it has to be viewed in that context. The quantification of how the style of communism that existed under Mao suppressed what could have been a much more prosperous country at the time and how the people still had enough animal spirits within them, enough entrepreneurial and innovative energy within them to recover from that tyranny and get to a point where economically, at least they are way, way, way further ahead than they were in 1979 to the extent that the damage done by that period has largely been erased, not by the people who suffered under it, but by their children and their grandchildren, if nothing else. So some data to look at and some food for thought. And the question to ponder is how much longer can China grow at a much faster rate than the rest of the world? That is ultimately one of the biggest economic questions that we face today. At what point does the saturation and convergence occur? Now, if you like this type of content and you found this video interesting, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much for watching.